of the sermon this evening is aliens and time machines. All right, now before I get started, uh, I'm going to explain to you um, kind of um, all, what that's all about tonight in light of the Bible. But before we get started, just to give you, uh, confess my faults, I used to be a really big fan of science fiction. I liked uh, science fiction books, and there's a lot of science fiction out there in the movies and things that, you know, um, are, are still, I'm sure, produced um, today. Um, I used to like the adventure of it, you know, the, the, the books that were out there, and, and especially um, on these two subjects. But tonight I want to talk about these two subjects specifically in the context of science fiction. I want to tell you because, look, I mean, there's just a lot of, if you, if you pay attention to what's going on, if you're um, listening to the information um, that we get today, whether that be in the news, in the media, in uh, publications of all types, um, first of all, the first one we're going to talk about tonight is getting a lot of attention, especially lately, and that's this idea of aliens and, you know, extraterrestrial life and UFOs and all these different things. It's really, um, if you're, I don't really have any evidence other than anecdotal, but you can definitely hear the noise on it coming up. There's more um, articles out there about it. Um, it seems like there's more testimonies of people seeing UFOs um, lately. Um, so there's a lot more noise coming um, on the scene about aliens especially, but especially on time machines and time travel as well. And I'm not, I mean, you're kind of laughing and, and smiling, but th these are serious things. I mean, people are really looking for these things. Um, and time machines, same thing, time travel. Um, I'm going to show you um, what that's all about in a few minutes. We're going to look at aliens first, but I want to show you first of all the agenda behind these two things and then show you you know, I'm going to show you why people are, are obsessed with these things and then show you the deeper agenda behind both of them, all right, which is why we'll talk towards the end about science fiction and the idea of science fiction. So in the news, in the news you see all these articles about aliens and UFOs and all these different things. Now it's been constant, you know, for the last several decades there's been constantly um, stories about this, but especially aliens we're going to talk about first. But um, lately, it's been a lot more, and I'm going to tell you why that is as well. So the point is this. You say, what's the big deal? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. You're in Genesis chapter 3. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so you say, what's the big deal about aliens? People are looking for aliens. You know, isn't that kind of benign? Isn't that kind of like, isn't the Bible kind of Switzerland on that whole thing? Like, you know, whether or not there's aliens. The Bible doesn't talk about you know, aliens in outer space or anything like that. So couldn't it be possible? Well, the first thing I want to show you is what these two things, aliens and time travel or time machines, I want to show you what they're attacking. And then I want to show you the overall agenda of these two things. So let's first talk about aliens. You're in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, of course, is the story of the fall and man getting thrown out of, Adam and Eve getting thrown out of, the Garden of Eden, all right? And look, they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden for a very specific purpose that I'm going to explain to you in just a few minutes. But you say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal if people want to write articles about aliens, if aliens exist or they don't exist, all right? But I'm going to answer the question to you whether or not they exist or whether or not we will ever find aliens. I'm going to answer that for you tonight as well. So you heard it here first, okay? You heard it here first. So what is the big deal? What is it attacking? What is it attacking? Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 14. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 14. Of course, we're talking about the creation here, the process where God created everything. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, he's talking about um, what he created outside the earth. And God said in verse 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from night, and then let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, first of all, I have a little note in my Bible. If you write in your Bible, there's a definite connection to time there um, when it comes to the creation of the stars and the heavens and the galaxies and the moon and all these different things. But the point is, they're for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. So, what signs? Signs of, uh, you know, signs of what? You know, God says he created these things for signs, for, you know, but of what? For who is the question. Go to Isaiah chapter 13. Look at verse number 10. 
Isaiah chapter 13, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in, its going, in his going forth, talking about the sun, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. In Mark chapter 13 and verse number, this, this, by the way, is all over the Bible. Mark chapter 13 and verse number 25, the Bible says, And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. In Psalm chapter 136 and verse number 9, the Bible says, The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. But the point is, in Mark chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, Matthew chapter 24, and other parts in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 6, I believe it is, is we're talking about signs of, you know, the rapture, signs of Jesus coming back, all right? So that's the first thing. The first thing is that the stars and the moon and the sun, for signs of what? For signs of the end times. The end times events, you know, will be shown, those signs will be shown in the stars. So that's the connection. You say, what signs of what? of God bringing things to a close is what God put those things in place for, all right? And also in Psalm chapter 136, it says, the moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. You know, he, he put it there to literally show us his mercy and how, how infinite God is. That's what the Bible is saying in Psalm chapter 136, is that he put the stars and the galaxies and all these things in place to show us the depth of God to show us how just like there is no beginning and in, there is no end of God. We can't see the end of space. We can't see what's beyond. Look, we think we can. We think we can try, and I'll show you that um, tonight as well. But we can't even fathom the, the, the tiniest part of it. It's so infinite. But the Bible says that God put it there to show us how infinite God is. All right? Look at Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8 and look at verse number 3. Psalm chapter 8 and verse number 3. So the Bible says in Genesis 1, you're turning to Psalm 8, it's for signs, it's for seasons. Of course, we know how, you know, the sun and our relation to the sun creates winter and summer and spring and fall. And for days, obviously, days and night, you know, we have the lesser, you know, light by night, you know, the, the, sun, the moon reflecting the sun's light still gives us light at night. The stars give us some light. There's actually machines that work on starlight that allow people, you know, this is how, this is how um, night vision goggles work. We were talking about this a few weeks ago, but night vision goggles work by the light of the stars. So these things God put in place for days, for years, for us. Look at verse number three of Psalm chapter eight. Psalm chapter 8, look at verse number 3. It says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers. So here, the psalmist, you know, David, is saying, you know, when I consider the heavens, David looked up at the heavens and the galaxies and all these things, and, you know, I assume he didn't have, like, you know, city glow or light pollution at that time, right? He could probably see every star and every galaxy you've ever been on the top of a mountain or in a really dark place or out in the country, especially in the wintertime. Boy, can you see the stars. And he's saying he, he recognizes that as the work of God, the work of God's hand. He says, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, ordained meaning put there. You know, God put those things there. And then what, what is the conclusion that he comes to from that? He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He's like, I look at all these things that you put there, and the conclusion that David comes to is like, man, who am I? Who are we as, a, as, a, as humans? Who are we? That's the psalmist conclusion. So the point is the Bible is very clear, and I could read you verse and verse and verse, but the, I'm trying to get you to understand that the Bible is very clear that God created the moon, the sun, and the stars, and all these galaxies and all these things that we can sort of see outside of the earth to give us seasons, to give us, us, signs, to give us tides, where the moon comes and, and moves the tide of the earth. He give, to give us lights at night, to give us all of these things. The point is, 
I'm trying to get you to understand is, is the purpose was for us. The purpose was for God to communicate and to do these things for us. Show us his power. It was all in context of us, folks. The key takeaway here, I'll say it again, is us. Humans, okay? Not aliens or, you know, little green men or whatever. It's us. Earth, earthlings is what the whole point of all the galaxies and all the stars and the sun and the moon is. Humans on earth for us. Scientists can't believe this today. They can't. Now, I'm going to tell you why they can't. They must do anything to destroy evidence or theories that suggest or point to the fact that we are unique in the universe. This is why they're looking for aliens. As a matter of fact, this is why they must find aliens right here. You say, what kind of evidence is out there besides the Bible that we're unique in the universe. Well, I'm going to, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence. One of my favorites is this, though. One of my favorites is this one. My, one of my favorites is called the axis of evil. One of my favorites is called, and it's called the axis of evil by modern day scientists, by the Stephen Hawking's and the Neil deGrasse Tyson's and all these, you know, Mickey Ukaku and all these people that we've talked about have dubbed this, you know, modern science has dubbed what I'm going to tell you about the axis of evil. So first of all, there's been a number of satellites. The idea is, is that, you know, we were created by a big bang, you know, tens of billions of years ago. I don't even know what the, the, uh, the current number is, 80 billion or whatever it is. Years ago, there was a, there was a, a, a microscopic dot. Everything was smashed into a dot and it exploded in the big bang. This is the big bang theory that just, it's, it's fact now is what they're teaching, all right? So everything exploded, and all of a sudden you just had, you know, the universe, right? You had the Earth and the Sun and the solar system and the Milky Way and all these different galaxies came from this explosion. So what scientists have predicted is that there's this background radiation. Basically, what it is is it's a measurement of the temperature of the universe. So you have this explosion that happened, and so what they're thinking is that the temperature of the universe itself should be the same, basically the same all around. It should be uniform. Since it was one microscopic dot, it exploded, everywhere you look should be the same basic temperature. So what they did was they actually sent up satellites. There's been three satellites that have been sent up so far in the last 40 years that have tried to map, that have mapped, the literal temperature of the universe. They call it the, the cosmic uh, microwave background, the CMB. And it's basically mapping, it's a temperature map of the universe. If you just take our perspective, it, you know, and it just maps the universe around us and the temperature around it. And they're just, they're assuming that it's going to all be uniform. All right, but three times they've sent up satellites and three times, especially the last two that had the technology to really map close temperature differences. There was one in the 90s called WMAP. You can look this up. There's another one called the Planck satellite that was sent up just back in 2009. And what happened was, they first of all, the data was consistent between all three satellites, especially the last two. And the temperature is not the same across the universe. They found that as they mapped, you think about it, actually, there's a balloon right here. I'm going to use it as, the, as an example. They actually mapped a 3D image of the, the temperature of the universe, all right, with these satellites. They came back with these temperature variations, meaning there was hot and there was cold spots on the mapping of the cosmic microwave background radiation of the universe. Satellites agreed. The data was good, all right? But the interesting thing is, is as they lined up the hot and cold spots, and drew lines, creating a plane in a 3D space. If you would just imagine this balloon, if we would draw swords through the cold and the hot spot, and the cold and the hot spot, and, and create a 3D point, at a 3D point in, inside the plane of this balloon, guess what was at the intersecting point 
of those planes? The Earth. I mean, it's a fairly amazing result when you think about it that way. And guess what? That suggests that the Earth, look, all it suggests is this. We're in a unique spot. We're unique. We're in a unique place in the universe. That's what that suggests. Thank you, balloon, that was randomly there. But the point is, that's why scientists today call this the axis of evil. I'm going to read you a quote from Lawrence Krauss, who's one of the, you know, he's one of the top, um, one of the top theoretical physicists or cosmo, you know, astrologists or whatever you call them um, in, you know, the world today. But here's what he says about the CMB mapping and this axis of evil. Interesting, interesting quote here. And I want you to remember three words that he says, quoting this. He says, some people have even suggested that there is a structure in the CMB, that's the map, that's related to where the Earth is. Listen to what he says here. Which is crazy because we're nothing special. So what does he do? He just dismisses it because we're nothing special. So he's got this idea in his head and evidence that points against this preconceived idea that he has is simply dismissed. This is not science, folks. This is not a scientist. A scientist does experiments and analyzes data to lead him to a conclusion. He doesn't come into an experiment. Look, you could have an idea, a hypothesis, but he doesn't come into an experiment and simply throw away all data that doesn't fit his hypothesis. But that's exactly what science has done for the last 150 years. And this is why we have, you know, this is, this is why we have these things like we're looking for aliens and all these different things. Because look, here's the thing. They have to find aliens. Otherwise, we're unique. Remember his three words. We're nothing special. He dismisses the numbers, the data. Why? Because we're nothing special. But the Bible says we are something special. The Bible says it was all created for us. The Bible says the point of it all is to show us things, to show us signs, to give us light, to give us seasons, to give us all these things. That can't be. To the modern scientists today, that can't be. So they throw away anything that suggests otherwise. This is not science. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Enter aliens. Now we got to find aliens. You say, why? Because here's the thing, folks. If an explosion created it all, if an explosion created it all, billions, creating million, yay, billions of other planets and stars and all these different things, if it was all created by an explosion and we're nothing special, if that were the case, I would agree. There must be another Earth. There must be uh, other people or beings out there on planets that are like Earth. If we were nothing special and it all came from an explosion, I would agree. It, it, is, it is statistically, here's the thing you gotta understand. It is, let's pretend we believe in evolution and the Big Bang for like three seconds. If that's how it happened, it would be statistically impossible that we are the only ones. That, that's it. That's why they must find aliens, in, in a nutshell, right there. We, look, we would not be the only, uh, un, the only inhabitable planet, which is why, we're, this is why the search for aliens, if you're paying attention to news and science sites and all these different things, that's why the search for aliens begins with the search for other planets, the search for what they call exoplanets. Right, so you see that they're out there and they're first looking for planets that are habitable, that are, that are, that are near to a star in that, in that life zone where water can exist as liquid. So they're looking for all these different planets. And in this search, you know what you will find? You will find the wildest speculation that you have ever read in your entire life about anything. I mean, what you'll see is you go find some YouTube videos on this, and it's just these wonderfully made YouTube videos showing these massive planets with, you know, one of these YouTube videos that I, that I watched before this sermon, there's the planet out there that's twice the size of Earth, or I don't know, several times the size of Earth. It will take you a hundred hours to fly between continents, and it just shows these, 
this beautiful planet. It goes down into the planet with these graphics and just shows the, these massive creatures on this planet. It's all fake. It's all fake. It's all, it's, it's literally science fiction. It's literally science fiction posing as science. You know how they, you know how they found these exoplanets? They found 4,500 of these exoplanets. The most, and, and I'm just going to, I'm going to read you part of an article. The, the most Earth-like exoplanet that they think is the best candidate for us all to move to, or for aliens to be from, is called KOI 5715.10. It's 3,000 light years away, okay? A light year, you say, what in the world is a light year? A light year is the distance it takes a, a light to travel, a light that travels in a year. That's a light year, that distance. It's six trillion miles. All right, if we're just going to talk about distance, a light year is six trillion miles. It's 3,000 light years away. You're like, how could they even see a planet like that? They can't. How do they even know that it's a planet? They don't. They don't know. If you read how they actually find these exoplanets, what they're doing is they're watching light waves in, a, in a, some kind of radiation detecting um, you know, instrument or in a spectrograph or something, and they, they see light from a star, and they see a little blip in, in one of the light waves or part of the light waves, and they're like, that must have been a planet passing through the, the orbit of that star. They just assume that. Could have been anything. It could have been something bent the light or whatever. It could have been a black hole. I mean, it could have been anything, but this is how they identify an exoplanet. All right? I'm going to read you a quote. And if you, read, if you read the articles on these exoplanets very closely, at least the honest articles will have at least one or two sentences that basically say, we don't even know if this is a planet. Yet. All of these YouTubes are created, all these videos are created, and these pictures, every article has a beautiful picture of the tiny Earth and this massive super planet. It's a super Earth, is what they'll call it. I'm going to read you an article here. It says the planet name KOI, here's another one, 45, uh, 456.04. The unconfirmed exoplanet is thought to be similar to Earth for several reasons. And then it gives this little comment. As with other exoplanets, more observations are required to confirm the candidate found is indeed a planet, requiring a certainty of 99%. Currently, researchers claim it is 85% probable that it is an actual planet. So they claim that, right? And look, let me tell you something. I've seen people that write papers, and you're not going to get your paper published if you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm like 0.5% this is a planet. So you've got you to bump that number up a little bit, all right? The point is, they don't even know that these are planets. All right? They don't even know that, that these are planets. The, the point is they have to find these planets because they need to find that there's other Earths out there and there's other us out there. They must find it. It's literally a tenet of their faith that they must find these other planets and ultimately aliens. Alien life outside of Earth should exist if you believe this. If you believe in the Big Bang, you believe in evolution, it is statistically impossible that, they, that we would be the only ones. I mean, that's the bottom line. So to find a, a modern day scientist that doesn't believe in God, that's an atheist, that doesn't believe in aliens, that to me is weird. Because you must believe in aliens. You must believe in other life because it's just, but that's just not the case, folks. It's not the case. And here's another thing. The universe is not homogenous. That's another thing. You would expect not only other Earths to exist, it would be statistically impossible for an explosion. First of all, how can an explosion create anything? But whatever. You know, it would be statistically impossible if an explosion could create Earth and life on it that we would be the only ones. And also, it would be uniformly distributed. But it's not. The universe is not uniformly distributed. And this is another thing that's just dismissed. It's dismissed and it's explained away. Instead, we look up in the universe and we send Hubble space telescopes and we send all these devices up to just find these fantastic pictures. If you've never seen pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, you should go look them up. It is unbelievable. These massive galaxies that are just arrayed in these beautiful patterns. I mean, an artist could never recreate what God has put in the universe. 
And guess what? It's not homogenous. It's not evenly distributed. But what do they do? So they can't come up with how the, the bodies in the universe and the galaxies are moving. They can't figure it out by the fact that it's not uniform. So what do they do? They just create dark matter. Well, there's mass that we just can't see. Right? It's kind of like telling you, like, well, I've got a monkey in my hand. He's just an invisible monkey. You can't see him. But that's what people buy today. Oh, it's just it's dark matter, has all this mass that we can't see. So the universe really is homogenous. It's, it's really distributed. If you've ever wondered where dark matter and that idea came from, this is why. Because they look up and they see these beautiful patterns and these beautiful galaxies that are not evenly distributed. And they can't explain the motion of the universe and the planets and the stars. They can't explain how things move according to this, so they just make up imaginary matter. It's crazy. It's literally insane. Like, you could never do this with any other field, any, anything in your world. Like, look at, look at this. I've got a billion dollars in my hand. It's just invisible. Can I buy the house? I mean, it just would never work in any other area of life. So the problem is this. Modern cosmology, it's ideology driven. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's cherry picking evidence for an already set conclusion. And it's, look, it's just stacking assumption on assumption on assumption. You can't do that in any area of life and expect to be successful. You know what it's called? It's called a false premise. Have you ever heard the term a false premise? The we're nothing special is a false premise. Meaning, here's a, here's a false premise. All birds can fly, so penguins aren't birds. You see what I'm saying? So I, I, said, I said up front, all birds can fly, Penguins can't fly, thus, according to my first premise, penguins are not birds. But the problem is, the first statement I made was wrong. So everything I build from that, all, all swans are white. Thus, if I find a swan that's black, it's not a swan. So by my original statement being false, everything that I do from that point is wrong. I mean, it's kind of sad when you look at these people just completely wasting their lives on these things. But the conclusion I'm trying to get you at, get you to understand, is this is why they must find aliens. This is why modern science is obsessed with finding extraterrestrial life. Because if they are correct in their false premise, which they're not, they, aliens must exist. It's literally anti-God, is what it is. All right, what about time travel? What about time travel? Let's talk about time travel for a few minutes. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, and then I'll wrap it all up in kind of the context of science fiction um, at the end. Let's talk about time travel. Time travel is all over movies, all over books, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. I mean, it is what would, what would science fiction authors and Hollywood do if they didn't have time travel? What would they do? Right? But look, you say, what's the big deal? Why would you even bring up time travel in a sermon? Uh, look, space.com on 523, an article five, like literally a month ago, came up with an article, and the, the article st started off saying, science says time travel is possible. That's modern science. says it, And I agree with them. Modern science does say that time travel is possible. The Scientific American says the same thing in an article just a few months ago. NASA. NASA believes that time travel is possible. I'm shocked that the shuttle program was such a disaster. They believe time travel is possible. Did you know that if airlines had as many crashes, has as many failure rates as the shuttle program, this is not part of the sermon, that we would have 300 airliners crash every single day in this country? NASA is a disaster and it always has been. I mean, that, I've argued that with so many engineers over my career, it's ridiculous. But NASA is a train wreck, all right? But anyway, NASA says time travel is possible. All these huge, well-renowned scientific publications, every mainstream scientist will tell you that time travel is at least theoretically possible. That's where we're at today. Look at Genesis chapter 3, and verse number 17. What about the Bible? What about the Bible? Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 17. We're talking about the story of the fall of man. Eve ate of the, the, the tree 
of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's two trees here. Okay, there's two trees. There's not one tree. There's two trees that we're talking about. They were able to eat of the tree of life. They were not able to eat. They were not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they disobeyed God. They rebelled against God. Look at verse number 17. And, and unto Adam he said, because. Now God's like dishing out their punishment here. He says, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. We're seeing the curse on creation here. All right? We've studied this before. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. Meaning Adam's going to die physically. You see that? He's going to return to the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou shalt return. Meaning now you're going to die. Adam, you are going to physically die. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know the good and evil. And now let us put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. Now lest he, I'm sorry, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So this is an important point right here in verse number 22 verse number 23 and verse number 24 okay God did not throw them out of the Garden of Eden because he wanted didn't want them living in a nice place anymore he threw them out of the Garden of Eden for one reason and one reason only so they wouldn't have access to the tree of life because God commanded that man now that he rebelled against God was appointed to die physically that's what he just told him he's like you are going to return to dust your body is going into the ground. Look at verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep, to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, this is super interesting right here because in Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 16, when we talk about the sixth trumpet and the sixth vial, we see the four angels coming out of the Euphrates River. I believe that's these angels right here. So we see, he says, a flaming sword, it says he placed cherubims, it doesn't specifically say how many, but it says in every way, meaning north, south, east, west. So it makes sense that when these angels are loosed at the wrath of God in the end times to literally slay a third of the earth in Revelation chapter 9 and again um, you know it's told again in Revelation chapter uh, 16 because remember the trumpets and the vials you know are together they are this they're descriptions of essentially the same thing but that's these four angels all that to say this the curse the curse on man was his physical death and his spiritual death of which he needed spiritual salvation but look God told Adam that you are going to physically die and he protected the tree of life so he assured that Adam would not have access to it and he would physically die the wages of sin is death that's what the Bible teaches us we cannot undo this we cannot undo this no matter what we think, no matter what pills we come up with, no matter what kind of diets we all want to go on, we cannot stop the fact that as we are all sitting here, and I, as I am preaching tonight, we are dying. We are all headed towards our physical death because the wages of sin is death. That's why God removed access from the garden. It wasn't the garden. It was the tree of life that he didn't want them to have access because the punishment was death. So to think, you think about time travel and what's the, what's the goal of everyone wanting to travel through time and travel back in time? It's to, it's to cheat death. It's to, you know, the fountain of youth. Again, all these different things that, you know, everyone's trying to do. You know, this idea of time travel is that, you know, we can, we can undo time but we cannot undo time as a matter of fact I've preached an entire sermon on this turn to James chapter 4 turn to James chapter 4 
not only can we not undo time, God uses time. God uses time in the Bible to remind us that we only have so much of it, that we can't dial the clock back, that we can't, look, we can't go and, and undo something that we've done. We can ask for forgiveness, and the Bible talks about, you know, mending relationships and, you know, how to, you know, fix conflict between brothers and sisters, all these different things. But the Bible never talks about, well, get in your time machine and go back and just don't commit adultery. You know, don't ruin your marriage. Don't ruin your friendship. You know, don't fight against the Lord in your life. You know, listen, but God just tells us how to, you know, take plan B and how to fix things and how to show mercy how to give mercy, how to receive mercy, how to ask for forgiveness in humility. He never tells us that we can have anything to do with controlling time. As a matter of fact, the only time God uses time is to explain that we don't have control of it and we don't have much of it. Look at James chapter 4, verse 14. He says, whereas you not know what shall be on the morrow. This is what we say out soul winning all the time. You don't know when you're going to die. You know, you're a young guy, 18-year-old, 17-year-old, 16-year-old. You could die tomorrow. You could die in five minutes, for all you know. That's why it's so interesting that, you know, some people are concerned about dying. Some people aren't, because you, none of us have any idea how much time we have left on this earth. You know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. God here is using time to motivate you. He's using time to show you you don't have much time. You don't have much time. You better get saved. You better do what God tells you. You better get out there and use this little time that God gives you and start affecting people's eternity. Because that's the irony of our little time. Our little time on this earth, we can affect people's eternity. We can affect our own eternity in this little time that's going to vanish away. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14, the Bible says, For we must needs die. And are as water spilt on the ground, guess what? which cannot be gathered up again. There's no time machine. There's never going to be a time machine. There's never going to be time travel. There's never going to be aliens. There's your answer. Why? Because it can't be gathered up again. Because it's something that God is telling us, you don't control it. It's not something that I've put in your realm. All of this is born out of wicked Einstein and his bastard children, is where all this came from. This came from the theory of relativity, saying that, you know, the speed of light is variable, or the speed of light is constant, sorry, and time is variable. This is where all this came from. And it shows you, like, the wicked agenda behind things like that. And just because it can't be disproven or, you know, proven, <laughs> it works on paper. Yeah, we're going to change this variable instead of this variable. I mean, it, nothing's ever been built from it. Nothing ever will be built from it. There's never going to be a time machine. There's never going to be any way we can change time in our lives. The Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us so. But there's a common thread here. There's a common thread here. I mean, ultimately, this stuff, this stuff, you know, I mean, Einstein's like, you travel on a rocket, and you can slow time down. And you can travel faster than the speed of light, you can go backwards in time. I mean, it's all, it's all fake and just made up, right? But the point is, there is an agenda. There's an anti-God agenda against it. It makes for good books. It makes for good movies where you can put some kid in a DeLorean and he can go back and whatever, you know? I mean, but the point is, it's, it's at its core, the time travel and the changing time is claiming we are God, is really what it's doing. It's claiming we are God because it's ultimately trying to say that we can defy death. That's the really scary thing about it. We aren't going to defy death. Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man to die once. You're going to die physically. Unless we live unto the rapture, you're going to die physically and you're going to return to dust on this earth. It's anti-God, it's anti-Bible. And this one, this one is a little worse. The time travel thing is a little bit worse than even the aliens thing because it's literally man trying to be God. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. We will never travel through time because that is God's realm. And the Bible tells us that that is God's realm, that time is God's realm. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 8. 
2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 8. I mean, the theory of relativity is so silly that people accept it. I mean, the, the fact that you could believe that your feet are in a different time dimension than your head is, is, you know, that's the general theory of relativity right there. That, you know, connected, things that are physically connected could literally exist in two different times. I mean, can we just throw stuff out the window that doesn't make any sense? When you say a circle is a square, can we ask you to leave? You know, the, the discussion at that point? I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff, all right, that people accept. But this is, God confounds the wise, folks. He confounds the wise. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 8. It says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Is that true for you? No, it's not true for you, but it's true for God, because God transcends time. That's what that is saying. That's what that is saying. It says God is infinite in both directions. He transcends time. But guess what? The only way, and this is where the real wickedness of time travel and time machines and this Einstein's theory comes in, the only way that we can actually transcend time is by believing on his son. That's the only way we can enter into this realm of everlasting or eternal. There's only one way. That's the time machine right there. That's the only way that we can enter into the eternal is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to invent some machine to do it, but that's what it's teaching. That's what it's teaching, that we can go build a machine that can bypass Jesus. You say, you're reading too much into this. No, I'm not. I'm not. This is exactly where this stuff leads, and this is the agenda behind it. It's man saying he can save himself. Sound familiar? It's works-based salvation. Oh, man, you really read a lot into science fiction. Man doesn't have to save himself. Man cannot save himself. If man could save himself, God would not have had to come here and save man. God already did it. All we have to do is accept it. But this is this agenda of just trying to just bypass God with this time travel garbage. And like I said, you say, it's, it's cra time travel's crazy. Every single scientific mainstream organization in the United States, yea, probably the world, believes this. It's anti-God. You know what? It's anti-savior of the world. It's anti-Jesus is what it is. You say, so, so why, why now? Why, why are we seeing like this uptick? Because I'm definitely seeing an uptick in this stuff. Why are we seeing an uptick in all these articles about these things? This one's kind of my opinion, but here's, my, here's the first one. I'm going to give you two reasons. I'm going to give you two reasons. The first reason that I believe that we're seeing an uptick in talk about aliens, articles about aliens, the search for extraterrestrial life, and exoplanets. You know what's funny though on the aliens thing? Even Elon Musk. Elon Musk is such a unique character. I hope he gets saved one day. I think that would be great if he got saved. He gave, it, he gave an interview with Tucker Carlson uh, a few weeks ago. I told you Tucker was going to get kicked off the air, by the way. I predicted that one. He's just, he's saying stuff that's not, he's saying stuff that's not on the, it's not a, on the program especially with the, the anti-war stuff and all that. He, he's, not, he's not following the agenda that you need to be following. But the point is, he did a, Elon Musk did an interview with Tucker Carlson and asked, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase, but he was asked about, um, he was asked about, what do you think about X? Because Elon Musk, is, he's a space guy. He's shooting rockets. He's talking about going to Mars. It's interesting that Elon Musk is always just talking about go, getting to Mars. He's not talking about finding little green men. And he actually answered the question to Tucker Carlson, he said, I mean, it's really rare to see somebody so rich and so powerful that still has like a, a heart and a conscience that you can tell is still pretty much intact. That's, that's my opinion of Elon Musk. But he says, here's what he says. So do you, is, there, is there life beyond Earth? And he said, so, oh, man, how did, he, how did he put it? He basically said, um, he basically said it is highly improbable or something along those lines that there is life that there is conscious life beyond Earth. And then he added this point at the end. He said, basically, he's like basically saying it's impossible that there's life beyond Earth. And then he said, 
at the end of it, he said, and it's something that is, you know, conveniently ignored. You know, the results of that, that, hey, we're the only ones that are conscious, that's conscious life in the entire universe. He says, that is something that is surprisingly ignored by the scientific community. You know why they ignore it? Because they must have the agenda of we're nothing special. So what Elon Musk was saying in that comment was he was kind of calling out that scientific talking point that we're nothing special, that false premise. He has identified that false premise. This is not a Christian. I hope somebody has a chance to give him the gospel one day because I think he might actually accept it. I mean, I don't know. It just You listen to the things that he says, and you're like, hey, this guy's not a reprobate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, compared to a lot of other people in his position. But anyway, back to the point. The first reason that I think that we're seeing an uptick in all this talk of aliens and all this talk of time travel is, number one, this is my opinion, is to distract you. That's my opinion. I believe that it's just like a sleight of hand magician that can make something disappear. You know, I used to love watching like up close magic. Somebody that was just really good at sleight of hand, they could just take like a marker or a cards and or whatever and just make it look like it was gone. But what they would do is they would, you know, or even the, the, the ones I really liked were the guys that could like, you know, go up and like just take someone's watch in their wallet without even like the person even knowing and like put someone's watch on their other hand or something like that. And the reason that they can do that is because they're distracting that person with something. They have that person looking over here while they're doing something over here. And that's what I believe the devil is doing with this false science of all types. It's just, it's distracting people. It's getting people all wrapped up in all these different things. You obviously see that there's a satanic agenda, an anti-God agenda behind it, but look, they're trying to, look, I believe that clown world is cracking. I believe that the promises of clown world, people are actually, I think more and more people are waking up every single day and they're seeing that you know what this is evil this destroys this is dangerous this is not good I'm, I'm talking unsaved people and they must distract they must distract so what do they do I can't tell you how many conservative people that I know not Christians but conservatives that I know that are all wrapped up in this stuff aliens and, and all this science fiction garbage the American conservative might be the dumbest creature on earth. I'm not talking the Bible-believing Christian. I'm talking about just the, the American conservative that while, while the government destroys, you know, everything, while Satan destroys their kids, they're sitting there and they're, they're drinking beer, watching ancient aliens on the History Channel. I mean, this is, it's a distraction. It's a distraction from what's actually happening. And look, these wicked agendas, as they're pursued and they're prosecuted, they're, they're successful because nobody's paying attention. Nobody's paying attention. And here's the second reason, which I've kind of already talked about, but all these things are an attack on the God of the Bible. That's what these things are. That's science fiction for you, folks. And guess what? I'm not going to make a blanket statement and say all science fiction writers because somebody will send me a Christian science fiction writer. But look, pretty much, look, every single science fiction writer that I know is the, a rabid, anti-God atheist or just, I mean, think of it. Isaac Asimov, he was like, he, was, he presided over, I mean, he was one of the, the, the most prominent science fiction writers of the last 50 or 60 years. He wrote all these weird books and people just, oh, he was a futurist and all this. He was, the, he was the founder of the humanist society. He hated God. H.G. Wells, ardent, ardent atheist. L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, he was a science fiction writer that literally created the religion of Scientology. Famous rich people follow the religion that he made up like 50 or 60, 70 years ago, whatever it was. The point is, like, all, like science fiction is antichrist at its core. It is, it's kind of the conclusion that I'm getting, trying to get you to see. It seems harmless. It seems, and you know, another thing, 
Another thing, it's, it's pushing this evolution, it's pushing the Big Bang, it's satanic at its core as it attacks Christ, it's antichrist at its core. But here's what's interesting. Science, science today is science fiction. Isn't that interesting? But I mean, let's just take that one logical step further. Folks, science today is science fiction. All the science fiction stuff that I told you about, the aliens, the time machines, science today accepts it all. But guess what, folks? Science fiction is fiction. <laughs> Why is no one figuring this out? Science fiction, by its very definition, is false. And it ultimately leads to this idea that, you know, we can live forever, or we'll figure out a way to, you know, put our brains, this is transhumanism too, we can transfer ourselves into a machine. We can trans, because guess what? I, look, I'll give, I'll give transhumanists this. If we didn't have a soul and we didn't have a spirit, I agree, it's probably possible. I don't know. As soon as we can get enough memory and enough artificial intelligence ramped up, we could probably put a person into a machine, but it'll never happen because we do have a soul and we do have a spirit and we do have this spiritual aspect, but it's all pushing, all this science fiction is pushing this idea that we can become God. We can take the place of what only God can do. Only God can give us eternal life. We will only live forever through Christ. That's it. Isn't it funny how every single agenda, every single thing that I get up here and we talk about, it always ends up attacking Christ. It always ends up attacking the Bible, which is Christ. So just, I just want to kind of give you an idea. So when you start seeing all this stuff and you see all these things thrown in your face and they ramp it up faster and, and more, at least you understand, you know, what the, it's not harmless stuff. You know, I would never, I would never, I, I'd actually be more worried about like this kind of teaching than like the Harry Potter stuff. They're both wicked. And I mean, I wouldn't be feeding any of those things to my kids. But I mean, there's an evil antichrist agenda behind all this science fiction stuff today. Because it's exactly what science believes today, and it's anti-God at its core. It's trying to get rid of God. But guess what? You're never going to get rid of God. You're never going to find aliens. Hey, everybody that spent billions of dollars on this, they're not there. You're never going to make a time machine. You're never going to travel through time. Stop working on it. There you go. You send me the dividend check or whatever you say. But the point is this. It, it's God is real. This is what's true. And everything else is just, it's fake. It's trying to destroy the truth. And God promises that they'll never be able to destroy the truth. Thank God for that. Let's bow our heads and have a word.